Oh, we are recording in progress. Look at that. All right. Okay. All right. So I was, so we'll wait a few more minutes for, you know, because we are clearly on CCB standard time. Um, since this is a different time than usual, I'm worried that maybe some people didn't look at the, I realized this week the number of people that look at the, that look at the schedule is actually remarkably small yeah it's almost in the negatives um <laughs> yeah because we had a we had a concert at dinesh and uh the schedule said it was in the community room but it was actually in the uh it was actually upstairs in the in the dining room and i sat in the in the in the community room and there were probably not more than 10 people that came in saying but the schedule said Right. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so it goes. All right. Hello, Connie. Hello. And I got I got snacks because oh, it's special. <laughs> we were supposed to have a lunch, but one thing led to another, and there was a lunch. Lunch. <laughs> well. No, but it's the issue is that um, the issue is that the people yeah. from Saturn were supposed to come down and have a whole day in Brookline, including a, a lunch on uh, somewhere on Harvard Street, and um, and then you know coming here for the lecture. But uh, it was too much for people to contemplate schlepping all the way from Revere right. to Brookline. So. That makes sense. Yeah. So they'll, they'll join. So they'll join us on Zoom. That's okay. I feel so slept like there is. I mean, yeah, right. We used to slept in the night years. And you're right. Yeah, making not uh, as healthy. If you know yeah. I mean, we, uh, and honestly, with the traffic, too, I might not be as healthy. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of time on the tunnel. Yeah, so it's, it, would be a, it would be a long ride. So. Oh. And the traffic going back would be tremendous. Probably on a second. Yes. Yes. He, he, yeah, Jim was saying so he's, he's the only student that actually lives in Staten. Hurry up. All right. So we'll wait a few more moments. Maybe we'll have some cookies. Okay. Or do we have cookies are always there? All right. So we just can throw them out like that. I can put them on a plate. But he's, he's so good at how oh, and they were, you know, that everything where everything is. Yeah. yeah. Right. And he, and he does know where everything is. Yeah. Do you think small plates are enough? No. So we can just put a few on. Oh, I was thinking just one big one and no. everyone could just grab rather than wasting all that paper. Yeah, one big one and just a around. Yeah, but there is a lot of squares on there. You have napkins, Rabbi? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm sure that Manuel has napkins. It's not that upset, but no. Whoa. Yeah, it's my Whoa. I've never sat on a seat before. I don't recommend it. Byron. <laughs> Thank you for coming. You're welcome. We get to the game. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. It's so sorry. Great memory. Going next week. Well, thank you. It's been a chance to want a cookie. Thank you. Oh, you are on a cheese stick. No, it is a vanilla prana fento. No, thank you. It's a resistance stick. So there's plenty more cookies where those came from. So let's not give them to the dogs. All right, so I think we're going to get started. So I'm going to let uh, I think I'll let Rabbi Steve introduce uh, himself uh, and his his background. He's the I know he's the founding director of ESHA, which is an organization devoted to integrating 
uh, engage in those means into Orthodox communities, but I'll let you say sure more than that. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Rabbi, for uh, orchestrating this and for um, you know putting it together. Um, I uh, I'm Rabbi Steve Greenberg, uh, a uh, uh, an ordained rabbi from Yeshiva University's Rabbi Isaac Elchanan Theological Seminary. Um, a number of years ago, you may know that Yeshiva University is in the news recently because it's attempting to uh, put some breaks on a on a student run in the college, a student run support group for LGBTQ students, and they are attempting to resist that while taking um, public monies. So they've been in the news. And uh, so, um, uh, you know, the challenge in the traditional community of making this, um, making the presence of LGBTQ people um, something that they can, they, they can continue to want and the communities can, can continue to offer has been challenging. Um, one of the ways that I do my work is that we we are in contact with 240 some pulpit rabbis all over the U.S. and Canada. I'm trying to get them to move um, uh, toward more inclusion and embrace. And we work with LGBTQ folks, um, creating support groups for people who grew up Orthodox or who are and remain modern Orthodox or wish to so we have many people, a number of people who want to convert into Judaism who are gay or lesbian or trans and they're Orthodox. So we manage both working with the communities to move them and working to the queer community to get it to feel like, you know, it can support um, a, a level of serious Jewish life. So part of the challenge of bringing together these two worlds, the world of, of the religious tradition and its resources, and the world of queer contemporary identity, which in the biblical rabbinic period probably didn't exist in that way at all, right? There were no sexualities to speak of. There were prohibited behaviors and ideal life forms. But, but the identity of an LGBTQ person, um, certainly a gay lesbian person, was not something that probably the, the biblical um, you know, uh, era or the rabbinic era would have been able to, to frame thoughtfully. Now it's really clear that um, the whole segment of the human population um, is uh, doesn't fit into the categories of of uh, either uh, gender specific specificity, meaning it's not everybody is only male and only female, and not everybody is straight. Um, many people um, want committed, loving relationships with a person of the same gender or sex. So, so the challenge of this work is to figure out um, how to get the voice of people who experience their lives and their sexuality where they are gendered differently. And the assumption that many people have is that this is a totally modern thing and that the ancient world, there were no such people. It was rare if it existed at all. And, what, and, and, and the reason they say that is because, generally speaking, the, the, it's hard to um, historically be present when you're not given a voice. It's like it's almost like the recovery of female leadership at a time when women were not given access to power becomes a very small book. And you need to dig deeply to find um, female leadership and its resources early. The same thing is true for minorities, right? Well, it's certainly the same thing is true for queer identity is that even to find the presence of a queer voice, it's not obvious to historians until um, this century. It was a, not an obvious um, thing to do. And as we have moved into following, you know, I would say the, um, the late 1800s, um, it, you know, the move, by the way, in Germany with a Magnus Hirschfeld, a Jew and a uh, 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 you know, a, a German who attempted in the early 20th century to make some claims about uh, gay identity that were um, not nefarious. Uh, and uh, like that began in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. But 
the real resource that gave birth to it was in the, the in the 1950s through the early and late 60s with the beginning of queer um you know with the lgbtq liberation movement as soon as those began there was a real interest in finding voices that had eluded us and so what i have for you is a bunch of characters that um that might not have been seen gay at one other moment of jewish history because there was no word for it i think when i was 17 i don't even think i knew what the word gay meant and certainly they didn't know in the rabbinic period so the question then is can we find materials from the past that make us you know that open up our eyes to the possibility that human beings come in many more flavors than than merely male and female and straight so i'm going to just travel through and we're going to there are more or less six characters you'll you'll see there might be a few more if we find them but um who i think are queer voices and what they do solve any problems the tradition is a this reading what it is done is it's complicated, it's nuanced. It, we make room for what was not visible. I'm sure you've been in a circumstance where you've been, you know, like in a place where you simply haven't noticed something until someone points it out. And so the pointing out of gay identity ended up giving birth to the, to the discovery of characters we wouldn't have thought that about. This is one that you probably know because it's been celebrated, you know, quite recently. Um, and this is the relationship between David and Jonathan. But I suggest a, a walkthrough of these texts that's a little different. And so we're going to do David and Jonathan. We're going to do um, some couple of rabbinic, uh, rabbinic texts, um, a, a very uh, exciting one that, you know, kind of addresses um, a, a rabbinic sense of uh, queer identity that's interesting. We're going to deal with a couple of the evil ones and um, and hopefully some late medieval early renaissance. So um, buckle your seatbelts, by the way, I want to be clear um, uh, that this is not even PG. It's a little bit more like you know, like it's an R-rated session. So as long as we're even NC-17, but it could be. It could be. Okay. Manuel Lake, thank God, is already 19. So shoot. <laughs> okay, good. Everything's okay. Okay, good. So, so let's dive in. And I'm going to move quickly so you can look at the text, but don't worry if you're not getting it visually. You're going to get it. You'll hear it. So this is the story of David and Jonathan's relationship. Saul is just slaughtered. <laughs> Uh, Goliath, he comes in and and Saul is really wants to keep him as a soldier in the army, but he's a very young man and he's done this amazing deed, right? So David is explaining, he's holding the head of Goliath. David finished speaking with Saul. Jonathan's soul became bound up with the soul of David. Jonathan loved David as himself. Saul took him into his service that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Jonathan and David made a pact because Jonathan loved him as himself. Okay, so before we go further, who loves who? David loves Jonathan. He's not loving anybody here. We have not been told about David's feelings, correct? Just Jonathan and who else? Saul. Saul doesn't want to let him go home to his parents. Saul's also smitten with David. Smitten with David as, wow, what a marvelous young man. The child of is smitten, and the language is clearly used of love. But what does it actually mean? We're not really sure. And focuses on a behavior that seems readable in at least two different ways, but it, it also invites us to think maybe there's something more emotional and maybe even um, supporting. There it is. 
So Jonathan David made a pact to Jonathan loved him himself, and then Jonathan took off the cloak and tunic he was wearing and gave them to David together with his sword, bow, and belt. So imagine, sure, if you're a movie, you know, uh, director, and you watch Jonathan undress and dress in David those same clothes. So that could be a ritual of like being adopted into the into the aristoc aristocratic family, becoming a brother. Of, you could read it that way, but how could you also read it? Is that Jonathan loved David and he emotionally he just dresses David in his own clothes. It's it, you could see this as a subtle erotic, you know, moment in their relationship. Okay. Um, and he took it off. He took off his cloak by David, and he gave it to David. Okay. Then, as soon as Saul, by the way, why did Saul take David into the house? So here's my theory. I'll tell you just a point. I think Jonathan is gay, but I don't think David is. I think Saul knows Jonathan isn't quite the man he wants him to be. And that is why he brings David into the household. Because what is he hoping? He sees how, how, how you know, Jonathan is smitten with David and he thinks, what a great model for masculine power, for soldiering, for, right? So he brings David in to man Saul up. What really happens? Wow, Jonathan then talked to Van Duck. What really happens? Jonathan falls even further in love, and Saul gets it. Saul flew into a rage against Jonathan. But you in love when he said to him, Mardu, you perverse and rebellious son. Hold on. Yeah, I lost there. He goes, You perverse and rebellious son. Don't you don't you think I know? that you've chosen the son of Jesse? What is being chosen the son of Jesse? Son of Jesse's day. For your own embarrassment? And for the shame of your mother's nakedness. Now, there are two readings again. Jonathan could have just been making David kingly and princely with the dress. And here Saul could say, you've chosen David to be my heir because you don't want it. And that shames your mother and me. But what could he be saying is that I see that you are in love with David. And that is your shame and the shame of your mother's nakedness. And to use the word erva, which means nakedness, it actually has deep sexual um, overtones. Because the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. In other words, all the prohibitions in chapter 18 prohibit um, you know, sex with a family member. It's ervat, you know, achoka, the nakedness of your sister, do not uncover. The word erva doesn't only mean nakedness, it has the connotation of sexual expression. So there's something going on here that Saul realizes, right? Um, okay. Um, I don't want to do all of these because we're going to end up not having time for others. But they, when when Saul realizes that David's a threat, he tries to kill David, and Jonathan has to protect him. And in a moment of struggle to protect him, um, they they weep, they kiss each other, and weep together. And David wept the longer. So why is David weep the longer? There's all kinds of questions about this. Um, and then the real question that people, you know, I think misread, real text they misread, is that then at the end of the story, Jonathan, Saul and Jonathan wage a, a, a very problematic battle against Philistines. They lose and, and Jonathan dies. Jonathan is killed. <laughs> So um, David mourns Jonathan, and he says, I grieve for you, my brother, Yonatan. Sarli alecha achi Yonatan, uses the word brother. 
you were most dear to me. Your love for me was greater than the love of women. So what's that? Your love of me was wonderful more than the love of women. Here's the thing. Then it would say, my love of you was greater than my love of women. But what does he say? Your love of me. In other words, what does David say? You love me more than women do. I think what's going on here is, is that David is using his friendship and, and, and Jonathan's infatuation with him in order to rise in power. But David is not, he, he cares about Jonathan. David's not in love. I don't see David as a gay person at all in this case, but I see Jonathan as really like in love with David. By the way, this story of unrequited gay love is like all over all kinds of literature, modern and ancient, where uh, two men meet. One, they're, they're both connected to each other emotionally. One is gay and the other is not. And the gay person suffers because they realize that it's going to be unrequited. Right? That story. And by the way, in those stories, very often the gay person is knocked off at the end because they have to be. So who gets knocked off in this story? Jonathan. Right? Um, any thoughts? Yeah. Come on. Okay. I put in my hand. So, let me just stop sharing. Oh, I wanted to go. I want to. Let's just. So, uh, here's what I want to. Uh, the rabbis, the rabbis saw the love of Jonathan and David and wanted to. They might have already suspected that there's something here that they cannot. You know, they can't really speak. And so I think they cleanse that love. And the rabbis are kind of like covering the tracks of that. Because if you're a gay reader, you are reading this with that eye. You're thinking, Jonathan clearly swooning for David when he needs him, dressing him, kissing him. And in the end, when he dies, David bemoaning the fact that he loved, Jonathan loved him more women don't love him in the depths of the ways that Jonathan did. So I think that's the story here. And then the rabbis sent to attempt to cleanse it. And here's what they do in Pirkei Avot. You may be familiar with this. All love, which is dependent on a thing, when the thing comes to an end, the love ends. There's a certain kind of love with, between people that's dependent on something you're getting. And when you stop getting it, you stop loving. That's a certain kind of love. Right? So a love that depends on something, when the thing comes to an end, the love ends. But love which is not dependent on a thing never comes to an end. Well, which is the love that is dependent on a thing? That's the love of Amnon and Tamar. So the story of Amnon and Tamar, um, it, you know, you can look at it. It's Malachim. And it's a story of the daughter of, of David uh, from another woman. Um, and Amnon, her half brother. So Amnon is smitten with Tamar until he rapes her, and then he hates her. So if it's a love dependent upon a thing, sexual desire, the moment the sexual desire is fulfilled, the love disappears. So that's pointing to the danger of sexuality or sexual desire to mimic love that is sustaining and it doesn't, it, if it's dependent on that heat of passion, when the passion goes, so does the love. However, a love that is not dependent on a thing, that is the love of Jonathan and David. So what are they saying? They're saying, well, Jonathan and David's love isn't erotic. <laughs> In other words, why do you understand what, what is it the woman protest, does protest too much? It looks like the rabbis are trying to get us to not read Jonathan as in love with David. Um, because it kind of, you know, it maybe complicates the story for a little. I'm going to share with you the, another rabbinic 
hex that is not part of R6, but I like it and I, I have a tough time not including it. Um, review them by position. This is the Jerusalem Talmud goes up to the attic in the study hall. So imagine yeshiva and there's a room and he saw two men, Nizkakim, having sex. And they said to him, Rabbi, make note that you are one and we are two. <laughs> okay, you're laughing, so you know what that means. What does that mean? Rabbi, two witnesses. You say nothing, Rabbi. You say nothing. You're one, you're two. You, 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 you can't, in other words, you can't know what you didn't see. And if you're just one witness, nothing happened. So it's remarkable that this text is in the Jerusalem Talmud, articulating something. Um, obviously, two things. One is, I guess some of the yeshiva students were fooling around. That's A. But B, they did need to do it in such a way that they wouldn't be witnessed. But C, the brazenness of saying to the rabbi, yeah, well, one, Richard. And bring your own money up here, and then we're two. Think, I don't think it's a come on line. No, no, I don't think so either. But I, I'm just like you know, they, if he brings up his own witness, they can they'll have two witnesses also. But it was, oh, I said it would be two witnesses yeah, again. Yeah, like y'all, you brought you came up you came up to the attic for you know right. it's a little bit of black. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to move to the rabbinic period. So because we've been introduced through the Jew. The, you know, the Jerusalem Talmud and Sanhedrin and the Pirkei Avot, which is Mishnah. We're going to go directly to Agmar and Bab Metziah, and it's a very famous Gemara. So Rabbi Yochanan is a really unusual rabbi. Um, you know, we, the word rabbi is used in, you know, like to cover both the person who's in, you know, in charge of the school or the synagogue you attend and the authors of the Mishnah and the authors of the, you know, the Gemara and the Midrash, like it's, they're all rabbis, but I would say that each of them, they don't necessarily uh, uh, fall under the same category of either of authority or of experience. So I just want to say here is that Rabbi Yochanan would be, it'd be hard, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody as brilliant and as audacious um, calling themselves a rabbi today. He's like, he's clearly uh, an iconoclast. Maybe we do have iconoclast rabbis, just put it this way. None, no rabbi I know would sit next to a mikvah and say, the women should watch me before they go to the mikvah because looking at my beautiful face and my beautiful body, they will have beautiful children. And that is what Rabbi Yochanan is saying. So Rabbi Yochanan is, is famous for being incredibly beautiful. Okay. And also incredibly vain. Yes. Well, so the interesting question is why would they want to portray him as vain? I think they portray him as just simply knowing that he has this power. So maybe he's vain. It's hard for us to know right. because would they be would they be wanting to portray him as vain? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It's just what he says. I survived from the beautiful of Jerusalem, because you know, he's saying survived meaning the destruction. One who wishes to see the beauty of Rabbi Yochan, now that's not him talking, this is the Gemara, should bring a brand new silver cup and fill it with red seeds of a pomegranate, place around its rim a garland of roses, place it where the sun meets the shade, and that is the vision. And that vision is the beauty of Rabbi Yochan. A silver cup filled with pomegranate seeds surrounded by a, a garland of roses in the sun. Where the sun meets the shade. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't know about you, but for me, that is a highly sensual portrayal of a rabbi. Like to imagine that that is what they said about Rabbi Yochanan. Now, they challenge it. Oh, what can the rabbis say? I have a list of beautiful rabbis. We had our own, you know, there's Gentleman's Quarterly with beautiful men. So they had a rabbinic quarterly in their period. Obviously, they had a whole list of very good huh? training cards. Yes. yes, yes, but you know, swimsuit rabbis. Right, right. You know, like like they have firemen. If you want, we can talk about the calendar. We'll yeah. Okay, good. 
Is that true? But haven't we been taught by our master that the beauty of Rav Kahana is like the beauty of Rav Abba, and the beauty of Rav Abba is like the beauty of our father Jacob, and the beauty of our father Jacob is like the beauty of Adam. These are all the list of the beautiful rabbi. By the way, I just want to say, it's really remarkable that the rabbinic tradition is not afraid of describing physical beauty to men, which in, in some cultures would be considered like what you do to what you, what you how you describe women, not how you describe men. So who is appreciating the beauty of men here? Other men? No, other men. So I want to say that this is a society that's highly homosocial. And it may be that the very homosociality of it makes it complicated when that gets expressed physically in sex. Okay? By the way, that's also true. There's a film out right now. It, that you might know about or hear about or see called Close. And it's a film about two boys, maybe in Scandinavia, or whatever, who have this emotionally intense loving relationship, but aren't, it's like it's not um, erotic per se, in the sense of, you know, like they're, they're not per se gay, but they are made to, to separate and to be aggressive with each other. Because the culture cannot bear male tenderness. Right? So if we have a culture that not only bears male, male, male tenderness, but nourishes it, then does that make it easier or harder for gay men to find themselves? Right? If Rabbi Yochanan is so beautiful, he's, all, he's, he's like more beautiful than all these people. Why is he mentioned in this list of beautiful rabbis? He's not Rav Kana or Rav Bao, you know? Like, why is he mentioned there? It says, Yochan did not have the splendor of face. Hadar Panim. You know, Hadar Panim is a board. So one second. He's beautiful and, or maybe because, he doesn't have a beard. So now what are you about? looks somewhat feminized. At very least, you know, he doesn't have what often in that, in those cultures, marks a man, which is a nice beard. Okay. Here we go. Rav Yochanan was bathing in the Jordan. Reish Lakish, and we, let me just say who Reish Lakish is. Reish Lakish is a Jew who he ended up becoming, you know, a juvenile delinquent and then a brigand, and then he became a gladiator. He was not, he had been, uh, you know, a nice yeshiva boy, and he had rejected it all and become a gladiator and uh, a, a fencer and a fighter. So Rabbi Yochanan was once his teacher. So, okay, so now Rabbi Yochanan's bathing in the Jordan. Rabbi saw him and jumped across the Jordan after him. Now, gladiators are famous for, you know, um, fighting in, you know, in various gladiatorial duels, raping women, basically taking women that they want. So it's interesting that she sees Rabbi Yochanan and thinks, oh, naked person in the water, and he puts his lance into the Jordan and vaults to the other side. Um, and we assume later that, you know, he, he takes all his clothes off and does that. Because Rabbi Yochanan's naked. When Rabbi Yochanan saw Rabbi Shimon, the son of Laki, she said to him, your strength for Torah. Already we're realizing we're entering into a, a discourse that is uh, very stylized. So Rabbi Yochanan says to him, I know you. You should take all that strength and not dedicated to conquering sexual conquests, but she dedicated to, to, to the study of Torah. So Reish Lakish replies, Shufrach le, le, le Michel. Your beauty is for women. Now, what does that mean? Your beauty for women. What do you think that means? It's not for men. 
You're so beautiful. You should have been a woman. I thought you were. <laughs> or it could mean your beauty is what I need to get women with me and we'll go get chicks. Huh? Your beauty, Linda Shea, is for is for seducing and 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 getting girls. So we don't know which it means. We just we really don't know. What does this mean? Because he was beardless, he was like he looked like a woman. What does it mean? No, he's like so beautiful. Women would swoon, and so if you get the really gorgeous guy to travel with you to the bar, you're going to get something because he'll get something. Right? He said to him, "This is now." Rabbi Yochanan speaking to Rachel Lakish. If you repent, if you do tshuva and come back to the tradition and come back to being a Jew, not a gladiator, not a Roman gladiator, I will give you my sister, I'll marry you to my sister, who is more beautiful than I. So Rabbi Yochanan says, okay, so if what you're really after is sex, I've got a beautiful sister. If you really like beauty, we like women. I'll marry you to my sister. You repent, meaning you come back to the tradition and the community. Rav Shlakish agrees. Okay. He, Rav Shlakish, by the way, don't mention here that he's like, you know, pawning off his sister as if he owns his sisters, right? Okay. Okay. That's that world. He agreed, Rav Shlakish. Want, and Rav Shlakish wanted to cross back to take his clothes. So obviously, he had deposited his clothes on the other side of the river before he vaulted over, but he couldn't, right? Why couldn't he get back? So one of two options. His lance didn't work. <laughs> okay, good. You got it correctly. But, but on some level, the Roman notion of masculinity is, is a lance to fight and a phallus to have aggressive sex. Instead, for the rabbis, a man is a study uh, is a student of Torah, and doesn't need an aggressive phallus to be a man. You just need a nice wife. That's nice if she's beautiful. So he he goes to take his Roman clothes, but he couldn't find them or couldn't get across. Anyway, Rish, Rabbi Yochanan taught Rish Lokish Mishnah and Talmud and made him a gavra. Rabba, a great man. So according to Daniel Boyara, who's a scholar in Talmud, this is the story of the conflict between Roman masculinity and Jewish masculinity. Jewish masculinity is softer and more intellectual. Okay. Um, so this is interesting. We could have just a different notion of what a man is that Rabbi Yochanan is representing. It's also so Rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan really is a kind of um, at least homosocial and maybe even more rabbinic figure. And in, in that moment, you know, this is what this is what this character would look like in this cultural. Talk about what happens when the story falls apart. It kind of it becomes a tragedy. Once they were disputing in the study, the sword, the lance, and the dagger, from when can they become impure? Now, you may not know this about impurity, but only things that are completely finished can become impure with the impurity of death. So if, you know, an animal is there and uh, a plate that is not yet finished falls on the dead animal, it's fine. If a plate is finished and ready to use, if it falls on the animal, it's impure, and you need to somehow cleanse it from that impurity. In other words, you need completion of a vessel. Rocks can't become impure. Only completed vessels can become impure. It's a more interesting set of concerns that might be articulated there having to do with Shabbat. We don't not have time for that now. But so, Rish, look, so when are they done? So look at the argument. Rabbi Yochanan said, from the time they are forged in fire. It's when their sword is finished. I don't, you may not know 
sword making. You, you, maybe you haven't made a sword in your life. If you haven't, one of the things you do is you get it very, very hot. And that is a kind of finishing of the sword. But Rish Lakish says, no, it's, it's when you polish it in water. You've got to cool it down and polish it in water. Okay. Now, here you've got, yet again, this phallic image that is either very hot or being rubbed in water. So and on some level, like, again, we're being pulled into the erotic almost against our will. Okay. Rabbi Yochanan said, Rabbi Yochanan insults, the, now, by the way, Rabbi Yochanan and Mishlakish are arguing. And it's more about sword making. You might think. <laughs> Rabbi Nudwish Lakish. Rabbi Yochanan said, a brigand is an expert in brigandry. Oh. And this is his student. Tauntingly, you should, weapons are the tools of your profession. Rish Lakish is hurt by this and angry. And he said to him, what have you profited me? There among the thieves, they call me rabbi. Here, they call me rabbi. All of a sudden, Rish Lakish is revealing that it was all about power and status, really? And that's what Rabbi Yochanan now is, really? Now, he's just feeling hurt, so he says that. Rabbi Yochanan becomes angry at, at, at his, his description of what Rabbi Yochanan had done for him, making him a governor, teaching him Torah, as just power exercise. But here's really why Boyarin says that this is really about masculinity. Boyarin is saying, the initial Jewish response to Roman, you know, violence, power, you know, aggressive sexuality is the Jewish power, mind, you know, marriage, you know, all that stuff. It is, that's, it's a gentle form. Boyarin's claim is the rabbis do. It could also be corrupted. That form of masculinity isn't perfect either. And he says, because they're basically harming each other emotionally in the repertoire in the repartee of Torah study. So Rish, uh, Rabbi Yochanan gets angry, and and he in his anger that becomes a curse. I don't know. They believe that there were curses. Rish, Rish Lakish fell ill, and Rish, uh, Rabbi Yochanan's sister is now married to Rish Lakish. Her brother, please remove the curse. Cried for him, saying. You know, she said, look at me. He, he did not pay attention to her. Look at the orphans. He said, you leave your orphans. I will give life. Do it for the sake of my widowhood. Place your widow's trust in me. Reish Lakish dies. Rabbi Yochanan is so angry. Reish Lakish dies. Rabbi Yochanan mourned him greatly. And the rabbi said, what can we do to comfort him? Let us bring him a Lazar, the son of Badad, whose physicians are brilliant, and put him before him. And every point that Rabbi Yochanan would make, the new student said, there's a tradition that supports you. Rabbi Yochanan said, do I need you? Do I need this one? The son of Lakish used to raise 24 refutations. He used to duel with me with words. Instead of a sword, he used his tongue. So he contended with me, as men contend, over Torah with the tongue, until the matter became completely clear. And all you can say is, I say good things. Now listen to this. Rabbi Yochanan used to go and cry out of the gates, Bar Lakisha, Bar Lakisha, where are you? The son of Lakish, where are you? Until he went mad. The rabbis prayed for him and he died. So here we have this scenario of a story of incredible love between men. You might think that Rabbi Yochanan is a little bit like um, emotionally preoccupied with Reish Lakish. Um, I don't think there was a sexual relationship going on, but I do think that there was a very powerful undercurrent of emotional attachment that looked pretty gay to me on some scale of reference. Okay. Um, okay. Um, we're going to jump to the medieval period. And um, then we're going to probably finish there because I want a little bit of time to just to open it up. Um, I have poems written by um, Spanish poets between the I don't know, end of the 900s, beginning of the 1000s, all the way up until the 1200s. 
that were pretty homoerotic. And again, historians would simply deny that they had to do with real relationships and real desire of men for other men. They, they, they basically saw them and denied what they were seeing. They said that they were Im imitating uh, Arab poetry, Arabic poetry that had similar themes and that they were just competing with them, but there were certainly no such real relationships. And they, if they were, they wouldn't have celebrated them in poetry. Well, all you need to do is read these poems. I, I have them in English. You can read them in Hebrew if you understand Hebrew, but they're incredibly beautiful. I'm going to read them in English. One is by Moshe Ibn Ezra, who is um, both a scholar and a Python writer of, of Jewish, um, you know, kind of prayer poetry, that some of which is in the Sidur, um, in the Mahzor. And you, the Halevi, who is a younger man, but only somewhat younger, um, who wrote uh, both the Kuzari, who was a philosopher, but also a poet, and, and wrote many po 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 you know, poetic compilations that ended up in the prayer book. Um, what is interesting, I'll tell you before I read them, is that these men knew each other. Moshe Ibn Ezra was very famous um, in Granada, in Spain. There was a contest, and uh, uh, Yudha Halevi entered it as a young man to write poems in the style of Moshe Ibn Ezra. And he won the contest, and after he did, Ibn Ezra invited him to live with him in his Granadan home. Okay? So, Ibn Ezra. My heart's desire, my eyes delight. The heart, that means the beer. The heart is beside me and a cup in my hand. Many denounce me for loving, but I pay no heed. Come to me, fawn, and I will vanquish them. Time will consume them and death will shepherd them away. Oh, come to me, fawn. Let me feast on the nectar of your lips until I am satisfied. Why, why would they discourage me? If it be because sin or guilt, I am ravished by your beauty and God is there. Let your heart not be swayed by the words of my tormentor, that close-minded man. Oh, come put me to the test. He was enticed and we went to his mother's house. There he bent his back to my heavy yoke. Night and day, I alone was with him. I took off his clothes and he took off mine. I sucked at his lips and he suckled me. But once he st his eyes stole my heart, his hand fastened the yoke of my sin, and he looked for grievances. He raged against me and shouted in fury, Enough! Leave me alone! Do not drive me to crime! Do not lead me astray! No, do not be unrelenting in your anger, Fawn. Show me the wonders of your pleasure, my love. Kiss your friend and fulfill his desire. If you wish to revive me, then give life, and if you wish instead, kill, then kill me. Remember, you read that. It is definitely not, you know, friendly. It's definitely not that what what Shearman, who was the historian who read these uh, and 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 wrote about first, um, did his, you know, he, he was the scholar in you know the in the sixties and seventies who who basically categorized these things said. These were written to a woman, but in the guise of a man, because that was an imitation of Arabic. I think it's just so not reasonable. You know, I mean, my fun look, take full note of my misery, lest I feel with sorrow. Drip, drip, drip goes my blood, my life in your hands. Let your heart be compassionate to the downcast too cannot eat and cries when you rage and waits for your love to return. Manna, manna, manna for my hunger, give my daily wage. If you rejoice in my love sickness, so here are my cheeks, abuse me then, afflict my life. No, no, no disgrace, just the casualties of innocence. I have fought this miser of the heart, and were he just a bit afraid of me, then perhaps sleep might come and I would fly, Fly, fly in my slumber, I would double dream. I would dream double. I would ask for his honeycomb lips, reddening like the setting sun, my eyes transfixed upon his form. How, how does this man from Aram color his lips so ruddy? His song plows my heavy heart, 
He sings to awaken my fire. Enough, my love, drink from my mouth. Bus, bus before me. This is uh, Hebrew, uh, Spanish, and uh, and Arabic together. Kiss, kiss my mouth. Wada waka ya ami. Put aside your black mood, my friend. So those are, oh, I think, pretty articulate portrayals. The interesting thing that I don't have an answer to is how these men succeeded in publishing their works. Clearly not everyone would have access to them. It was before the printing press. It's not like everyone knew these things. Those who wanted got them. Those who didn't want maybe didn't need to look. But it's just remarkable that, you know, this is the same period where Muslims, Jews, and, and Christians are living together in peace in Spain. You know, so it's an interesting period in human history. Um, this is a, I, 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 I've switched the dates just a little bit. And this one is later and the next one's a little bit earlier. These, the first one is um, a piece of response to literature by the um, Rashtam Ashwal ben Moshe of Medina. And this is, uh, as you'll see, a kind of uh, uh, narrative of, um, of circumstances that clearly touch upon what we would call same-sex identity and relationship. Um, they would call it just, you know, bad behavior. This guy is a cad. He's a, you know, a scoundrel. Um, and the story, what's interesting is the telling of the story doesn't particularly see same-sex misbehavior as anything other than general misbehavior. It's like, there are all kinds of ways to misbehave if you can. This is one of them. But seeing it that way, as opposed to seeing it as a, you know, a kind of demonic threat to the society, to marriage, to to, you know, it, that's just not particularly, you know, how it was portrayed. Here's the question. Yeshua, the son of an honored ape, Rav, approached us and said, 17 days ago on a Thursday evening, I left my house and found these two bachelors, Yehuda, the son of Yitzchak HaKohen, and Moshe Gokohen, and said to them, come with me. So the person who's writing this um, Yoshua takes Yehuda and Moshko um, and says, I need you. And we all left our houses and he entered the courtyard. And this Yoshua called the young woman, Floris, the daughter of Yosef. And she came down and I pulled out one new Venetian Cicino and I said to her, take this as your marriage payment and to them and, and to them, to these guys, you know, you know uh, Yehuda and Moshko, you will be my witnesses. She put out her hand and accepted. Okay. So it's just basically a, you know, it's like me, you know, a, 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 a imagine, you know, a, a, a story like it's kind of like almost, you know, Romeo and Juliet esque. The man is in love. Uh, he doesn't ask the, the father. He just goes and proposes to her, throws her, a, you know, a coin, and the witnesses see it and she accepts it. So he is basically trying to, you know, circumvent the process of formal marital phrase, because otherwise, why get two of your friends to come and, you know, be witnesses? Like, get away. Two words. Much who approached us um, on that Thursday evening, 17 days ago, and I and Yehuda were walking hand in hand, and I found Yoshua at the entrance of Papali's new house that he is currently building, and he said to us, come with me and see something. We walked with him and we left that house and we were outside her courtyard and we saw the young woman standing in the entrance between Papoli's courtyard and her father Yosef's house. And Yoshua said to her, accept this as your wedding payment. So it, it seems that Mushko now is testifying to what he saw. So, you know, first it's Yoshua talking about Mushko's testimony. And this is what they said in Greek. Na toto yaki dushi, which means this uh, this coin will now accomplish kidushi. You'll be my wife. The young woman was dressed in red, 
He told us that the three of them were alone. This was on Adar 532. At a following session, Rabbi Yosef Maratu approached us and said, you should know, gentlemen, that I've witnessed that Moshko is not an eligible witness because of transgressions that he committed. So now we are about to hear a litany of the wildness of Moshko in order not to do anything to him, but in order to disqualify him as a witness for this um, wedding that the father doesn't want, maybe even the bride, we don't know, doesn't want to be legit. So at the college session, we have some more other words, you should not trust Moshko. And call these witnesses and Moshko before the Beitin, and they will testify against him. And we called a few times, he did not want to come. And then we sent him an agent in the court, and he warned him in front of the witnesses, and he still did not come. And when we saw that he did, we accepted the witnesses against him, even without impressing. First, Rabbi Chaim Gabi testified that he saw Moshko masturbating on your camera. He cut his own. Now, to see that, I don't know, but that's what he did. <laughs> then David, the son of this, and testified that he was walking in a village along with a merchant, and they crossed an orchard fence in order to ask the orchard owner to sell them fruit. And there they saw Moshko having sex with another non-Jewish bachelor. When they saw them, they separated and ran away with their pants on top. Following this, Chaim, the son of Matatya, testified that one time he was walking past a large human zone and he saw Mushko having sex, consensual sex, with the same merchant that was mentioned earlier. This was within two months of the earlier event. In addition, the bachelor, Avram Demili, testified that Mushko tried to rape him. And in addition, the bachelor, Eliezer, the son of Avram, testified that when he was in Yaleta, it was so well known that Mushko was having sex with a merchant that they had a bad nickname for him. In another session, bad nickname for him, you can imagine what that might be. In another session, Rav Yudat Suri testified nearly two years ago, I was with some other bachelors, we were eating and drinking at Mushko's house, and afterward, everyone went home, and I saw Mushko having sex with Yaakov Mazel Tov. <laughs> All of these testimonies were given under the threat of excommunication or that they should tell the truth. At another session, the young man Yoshua, that's the original groom, the son of and confessed his sin. That his claim in Beijing that he had married the young woman Flores, the daughter of Rios, who was a lie and a fabrication. He never married this woman. He admitted he had committed a severe sin and started this rumor. And he explained all the things that led him to do this. He begged for forgiveness from Rios, the young woman's father, fell on his face and kissed his feet, asking that he should forgive him and that God should grant atonement for his sin. And at the same time, the pastors, Mushko and Yehuda, the witnesses of this marriage came and admitted their transgression, that their testimony regarding this marriage was a lie, and it was a fabrication. They taught us the circumstance that led them to do this, and they asked forgiveness that God should grant atonement for their sins. End of Shua. But so, I have no idea, like, the, the decision of an author and a religious, you know, leader to document a response like, not everything that happens gets documented. So why was this documented? So it's really hard to say, you know, as you can see that it's, it happened in, in Greece, but it's quite what this demonstrates is really hard to nail down historically. At least we know one thing. We know that at least in this period, in this space, um, you can be disqualified from testifying, at the very least in a marriage, if you were known to be a pretty you know, repeat offender of the prohibition of sex between uh, men, it seems particularly shocked or troubled. It's like, yeah, he's a cat, but nothing more. Now, it's possible to make that inference here, not necessary, but I think it's a very interesting text because it demonstrates that this existed and existed in a circumstance where, um, to put it this way, it came out when he was crazy enough, you know, like to go into politics, crazy enough to become a witness for a bad wedding. Like, had he been witness for a good wedding, it would necessarily have come out. He's witness for a bad wedding, and the father of the bride doesn't, like, want the wedding to go. Maybe even the bride herself doesn't. So then they're going to be motivated to reveal what maybe everybody knows but no one talks about. Right? So I think it's just very interesting because the social world in which this would be possible is a different social world than we were. 
And that's basically what I'm trying to suggest is that the social worlds here were more nuanced, less, less um, fixed, more open to human difference, even if prohibitions are still prohibitions. Okay, okay. The last text is incredibly painful and in, in just very beautiful. Um, Colonimus Ben Colonimus is a, he's a raconteur in religious society in, you know, in, uh, you know, Germany was not a country quite yet, but th this is a German principality. And it's 15th century. Um, and it is at a time when between the 12th and 13th centuries, a lot more um, uh, in, the, in the Christian world and in the Muslim world, but m even more so in the Christian world, there was a lot of move by the church to start punishing homosexuals, to start punishing people who are, who are different in either gender and sexuality, to start legalizing that, that and, and, and in an aggressive way. So, I mean, in the 12th and 13th century, you know, um, attacks on Muslims in the Christian world rise, attacks on Jews and attacks on people who are, you know, divergent sexually or, or, or uh, otherwise. Oh, so, whoops. Let's see, that was it. Whoops. I don't know what to do here. Let's see. Oh, here. What an awful fate for my mother that she bore a son. What a loss of all benefit. Cursed be the one who announced to my father. But oh, had the artisan who made me created me instead a fair woman. Today I would be wise and insightful. We would weave, my friends and I, and in the moonlight, spin our yarn and tell our stories to one another from dusk till midnight. We tell of the events of our day, silly things, matters of no consequence. But also I would grow very wise from the spinning. And I would say happy is she who knows how to work with combed flax and weave it into fine white linen. And at times in the way of women, I would lie down on the kitchen floor between the ovens, turn the coals and taste the different dishes. And on holidays, I would put on my best jewelry and I would beat on the drum and my clapping hands would ring. And when I was ready and the time was right, an excellent youth would be my fortune. He would love me, place me on a pedestal, dress me in jewels of gold, earrings, bracelets, necklaces. And on the appointed day, in the season of joy when brides are wed, for seven days, the boy would increase my delight and gladness. Were I hungry, he would feed me well-needed bread. Were I thirsty, he would quench me with light and dark wine. He would not chastise nor harsh treat me. In my sexual pleasure, he would not diminish. Every Sabbath, each new moon, his head would rest on my breast. His head would rest on my breast. The three husbandly duties he would fulfill, rations, that's food. I'm sorry, uh, yes, raiment, clothing, and regular intimacy. And three wifely duties would I all fulfill. Watching for menstrual blood, Sabbath, candles, and bread. Meaning challah. Father in heaven, who did miracles for our ancestors with fire and water, changed the fire of Chaldee so it would not burn hot, that's Abraham thrown into the, you know, the, the fiery furnace, um, you know, uh, uh, as the, the, the Midrash suggests. You change Dina in the womb of her mother to a girl. Again, the Midrash says that Dina uh, was supposed to be a boy, but she was changed in the womb of her mother to a girl. You change the staff to a snake before a million eyes. That's biblical. It's Moses' staff. You change Moses' hand to leprous white in the same story. That's also what happens in miracle. You and the sea to dry land. That's the crossing of the Red Sea, the Dead Sea, the Reed Sea. And in the desert, you turn rock to water. That's during their trek in the desert when Moses hits the rock, hard flint to a fountain. Who would then turn me from a man to a woman? Were I only to have merited this, being so graced by your goodness, what shall I say? Why cry or be bitter? If my father in heaven has decreed upon me and has maimed me with an immutable deformity, then I do not wish to remove it. And the sorrow of the impossible is a human pain which nothing that nothing will cure and for which no comfort can be found. 
So I will bear and suffer until I die and wither in the ground. And since I've learned from the tradition that we bless both the bitter and the good and the bitter, I will bless in a hushed, in a voice hushed and weak. Blessed are you, O Lord, who has not made me a woman. It's just a blessing that women say every day because they cannot say, blessed are you who has not made me a woman. Uh, I'm sorry, women say, blessed are you who has made me as I am. Um, he says, blessed are you who has not made me a woman. And he says it with the notion that it is that it is a kind of admission of submission to a God that has made him a man and not a woman. And he's blessing the painful. In other words, there's a, there's a rabbinic statement that one has to find meaning both in the terrible things and in the good things that happen to us. So we bless the difficult and the joyous. And he's claiming here that he wished he were a woman, but he has to make the blessing as men must make. Blessed are you, Lord, who has not made me a woman, even though I wish you had. This is among the most beautiful texts you can imagine for a trans person um, who has no social or, or uh, you know, physical, medical way of moving from one gender to the other, despite the fact that they felt all their lives they've been in the wrong body. It calls it an immutable deformity, right? Being in a body that does not conform with her inner life. I think it's incredibly beautiful. And the fact that it's there in the 1500s is quite remarkable that it was recorded and remembered and, and saved for Western. So that's it. Um, uh, it's been an hour. And any thoughts about what you like, you know, about the, just the whole picture that you've seen? Any, like um, a word that comes to mind or a thought or a, or a question? Yes. So all of this is about men. Is there anything like this about I'm glad you asked, because I should have introduced it. And again, you know, um, there's no record of, of lesbian relationships in the Torah. And there is nothing. There's nothing. There is, there is a scant reference in Talmud. But it's not no named persons. It's a story um, about uh, uh, a rabbi who doesn't want his daughters to to sleep together because if they do, they will. Um, uh, he's very, he doesn't say why, but then the two interpretations are they might you know have some erotic connection. No, that's what they say. No, it's not really what he's worried about. He's worried that. They will become because they'll like sleeping next to a warm body. They'll become susceptible to seduction. There's a you know a prohibition of nashim missile of women who rub, who if they do, um, are they marriageable afterwards to a priest? Because a woman who is not a virgin can't really get married, certainly to a high priest and maybe to a priest. And so the question then is. Is sex between women sex? And the answer is only penetrative sex with a man would deprive a woman of the ability to marry a priest. But sex between women is fritsuta ba'alma, just, you know, indecency. It's not nice. Those are the texts. There's no person in there and no person saying, ah. Like what I was looking for was a story where an individual is speaking. And even the one I included that I really didn't so want to include, even on the attic of the yeshiva, we at least have the words of these guys. We're one, you're, we're, you're one and we're two. So you get some voice, even if they're not named. But there's no lesbian voice in these materials. And um, in part because just very little female voice all. The last sentence there reminded me of a poem by a Spanish uh, author. It's a short poem in which a woman is praying, praying in church 
and she's in tears and praying to God. And what is she praying? That the baby is not a woman. The, the baby that she's carrying. Right? Well, because you know, of the machismo of in modern societies, yeah. you know, look, um, kings needed male heirs, you know, families, you know, um, so Steve and I, my, my, my husband and I, we, we wanted to be parents for a long time, couldn't figure out how to do it. We went, ultimately went with a reproductive clinic in India and, and, um, we made a baby and then came back, you know, some months later and picked her up and we were not told her gender because, um, even though they had many ultrasound and they, you know, the doctors do, but there's a law in India that you're not allowed to reveal to parents the gender of the of the fetus. Why? Practicing may not. Because in patriarchal cultures, there's infanticide for girls. Okay. So they don't want the parents to know. So this is not, I mean, it's true in, you know, in fewer cultures than it used to be, but you're absolutely right, is that, you know, um, females weren't, weren't, you know, didn't get a chance to speak. They weren't educated. And even worse, um, their, you know, uh, the, the success in births of girls is just less. I mean, look, even Pharaoh, he's, he's willing to kill the males because he needs to, to undermine the populace. He doesn't kill the female. Why? They're not, they're not, they're not his word. So in other words, a male son is a is is a is a is a member of another tribe. There's also the other thing about females, and that's this. And it's very interesting to think about the advantages of this, but there are disadvantages too, like if you think about it. Um women, I'll tell you the, I'll tell you the, the story that 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 is a, a fun story that leads up to it. I go to India uh, at a different time in my life. I'm going with a bunch of rabbis and we're going to do some work in a town that has no water and no electricity in Lucknow, Northern province. And at the end, after we transition to the school, so the people in the town and we, they, we, we and the rabbis want to get together and there's half of our, our male rabbis and half our female rabbis. I'm the only Orthodox rabbi. We, we meet together and the town's men will speak with the male rabbis. The town's women will speak with the female rabbi because it's a gender-separated society. So the men answer all our questions for about an hour, and then they say, can we ask you a question? We said, why not? So with the interpreter between us, they said, when a couple gets married in your community, does the couple live with the groom's parents or the bride? So somebody blurts out, neither. They live separately and often far away. And the, the people looked confused. And they said, well, then who takes care of the elderly? Mm -hmm. And somebody blurts out, we pay people to be, we pay strangers to take care of them. And then they look at us and say, does that make you frightened to grow old? And all of a sudden, I realized that it was no longer clear who were the primitives and who were not, right? So, so the the... Reality is, is that in many societies, women were, um, you know, a necessary for the care of infants and nursing. And because they were there, they also took care of the elderly, right? And so the, he was basically asking, who's responsible for the elderly? Is your sons who have more power and maybe earning power or the daughters? who actually are better at the job. So that's it was very interesting to me. And I, I guess the other piece of the story is this, is that daughters in tribal societies leave. Sons stay. Now, that may be not our experience, but in tribal societies, think about this. If you're a Benjaminite or you're a Yehudite, or you're a Danite, your daughter can marry any 
and from any other tribe, and then goes to live in that tribe and bears sons, it will be Danites. They will be her husband's tribe. Her tribe will get erased. In other words, on some level, women are not tribal. Structurally, it's why we retain the notion that women's names change. The woman doesn't hold on to her name because she's not tribal, right? So on some level, there's a weakness in that. It means that you know, you're basically swept away from your home to somebody else's home in, in some other place with some other family, right? And then you have to kind of assert yourself. Right? But what's interesting is, think about it this way. When, when the Jewish people need to be saved, in the beginning of the book of Exodus, who starts the saving? The Midwest. It's women who are not Jewish, who see a baby, and they don't care what tribe it's from, right? And the midwives who refuse to kill the male babies, they don't care what tribe it's from. And the daughter of Pharaoh, who sees this Jewish child and wants to save it. In other words, it may be that women are functionally much more universal, and in, in the process, you know, they have less tribal power, but, you know, one could claim it might be a better represent, representation of the human, of, you know, a deep human connection that transcends those categories. Anyway, I think it's very interesting that, yeah. that women are not mentioned, they are not part of the story. Um, but that is, of course, all very much changing. Okay. Um, any other thoughts about this material? Really not about this. It's just been an honor to learn from you. I, I'm just amazed. Amazed. And thank you. It was a pleasure. What does this resonate, say, in the community that you serve? It's a good question. Um, I, you know, I've written a book and some have read it and some people, you know, um, read it and don't like it. Some people refuse to read it. <laughs> but uh, look, I, I, I run an organization that works with LGBTQ Orthodox Jews and their families. And the truth is, is that there's a lot of movement happening now because young people are coming out and they're saying, I, I don't want to choose between my Jewish identity and my gay identity, or my trans identity and my Jewish identity. Mm -hmm. And so what's changing the community is people are, are offering their wisdom, their sensibility, their learning, their commitment, and staying in place. And, you know... You only get to change what you love. Sometimes. And even then, only sometimes. But you, you don't get to change what you don't love. If you walk away, no one will change it for you. So if you want the Orthodox community to move on this issue, then the parents of the gay kids need to stay. And you know what? Ideally, the gay kid needs to stay too. Because when the gay kid stays and finds a partner and, and the relationships are real and they say, what are you going to do? You know, my, myself and my partner are a member of Young Israel. I can tell you that we had a bat mitzvah for our 12-year-old daughter very recently. The rabbi could not have gotten away with doing that. It was just, we've been there for eight years. Now, people know us. It would, it would have been embarrassing for him to do nothing. Right. Uh, so when you when you when you plant yourself in a place and you say I'm here and I am like I'm not an alien I am my inner life is different and you're going to have to figure it out then slowly things are then they're changing uh, at our last parents conference I had a Sotmer couple and they're who came because they have a transgender child now so I'm telling you it's slow. And there's resistance. It's not perfect, but things are moving. I I w was a member of Young Israel, and Rabbi Gortz was about to leave, um, and he he uh, was very negative about um, gay people, 
And I, most people, a lot of people walked out. Very some people, I think some people left the shul because of his very negative, you know, view of. I mean, at that time, I'm not saying, I don't know who left because of it. I do know people who left and then came back when, when Rabbi, uh, when Helen, Rabbi David Helen, yes, yes, sir. Um, one of the things is the number of hyphenated last names, where their woman is not going to give up her last name. Look, well, the kids have hard times. Uh, I don't know. You know, we're all figuring it out. I know couples where the the wife's name is used for the family because it, they they like the name better. We're moving to a much more to a place where you know all the voices are being valued, and it is true that it's hard to imagine an orthodoxy that that deprives women of, of full personhood and voice and before they are, you know, like that's going to come either first or at least at the same time as LGBTQ acceptance. I can't imagine a circumstance where women remain second-class citizens and gay people are accepted. So these things will come together. Um, and are already doing so as well, by the way, as, you know, Jews of color are also finding themselves more vocal, more real, more present, you know, more committed to Jewish life and therefore um, not pushed out in all kinds of ways. Uh, that is why it's really, really important to support those initiatives that that um, make it real to be to have um, a, a diversity inside institutions, mm -hmm. because the, that diversity itself it, it ends up proving its its righteousness. Mm -hmm. We it, and it's true in this country. Like the reason immigrants, and it's you know we're struggling with it here for all kinds of reasons. The reason immigrants uh, are valued here is because look what they've done to the country. They've incredibly enriched the country. If you go on record of enriching the country then no one can write you off, yeah. right? Yeah, they can try. Yes, yes. I feel like we've come a very long way. Yes. Um, when my sister first came out, there was no one. Right. It was that generation. Right. And now uh, she's 87, and she's at the last portion of sustaining the different groups that she has organized. Wow, where does she organize them? Boston, Hartford. Oh, lovely. Yeah, and uh, the acceptance of the family member has changed drastically. When her first book was released, people came to me and said, I'm glad you're here to support your sister. My family won't come and support me. Yeah. Well, listen, I deal with that a lot, but um, it, it is beginning to change. Yes. And, and in some places, quite dramatic. Okay. Yes. That was an Orthodox rabbi. Yeah. What kind of a relationship can you have with the Orthodox rabbi in Israel? Oh, I mean, it, it's a really good question. I would say that, you know, I, I have a number of rabbinic, close rabbinic friends in Israel, but um, Israel is, you know, it's a, it, put it this way, we used to think, you know, that you know, the diversity was everywhere but the Orthodox community, but let me just tell you, Orthodox means, you know, two dozen different things. And so you can be Orthodox and be anti-Zionist and be Orthodox and be rabidly pro-Zionist, in fact, even to a fault. You can be Orthodox and be committed to um, really giving women full personhood. I'm, I'm part of organizations that do that. And I support a rabbinic school for women in the Orthodox community. And you can be part of a community where women have no voice and are not even really fully allowed to participate or even to be present, you know, in synagogue in lots of ways and have to be, you know, kind of shuttered in homes in, in primarily. You can, you know, uh, there are um, uh, Sephardi communities and Ashkenazi communities. There are, there are rationalist communities and there are mystical communities. 
Orthodox is not one thing. And it helps to not, like, by the way, n- neither is gayness. Mm-hmm. But it's not one, there's not one way to be gay. Right? And so partially as community, we need to, we use these shorthands. There's not one way to be a woman. There's not one way to be a man. So we use these shorthands of woman and man to help us organize the world. We should all be prepared to recognize the diversity inside each of these words. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and very, very great to see you, Rabbi Stephen. Um, don't be a stranger. We're okay. always, always welcome to come and uh, teach, learn with us, and so on. All right. Okay. I missed the beginning. Where are you, a rabbi? Uh, How are you? Where are you? I, I mean, the, the uh, uh, founding director of an organization called Eshel, which is the tree Abraham plants outside his tent as a symbol of welcome. And uh, I've been doing that for, you know, since I don't know, 2010, so about 13 years. And where are you located? I'm in Brooklyn. I live around the corner. Thank you. You're welcome, Judith. Welcome. So glad you had a chance to meet. Uh, well, you probably met Rabbi Greenberg already, but uh, glad you had another chance. But uh, yeah. All right. Good deal. Yeah. All the all the teacher mall here. To see what you're doing in Oh yes, he's he's like, wait, what are we still doing here? Isn't it time for another walk? Don't I get to go on another walk? It's your turn. I'm sorry. It's your turn. Yes. Yeah. This is pop. And he is very, as I think, yeah, as I tell, as I tell, as I told Steve, you know, he's one of my best students. He sometimes gives me, you know, dirty looks, but he, you know, he never is completely disrespectful. Every once in a while, you know, Devastra brought her dog in, and every once in a while, Puck will get into a conversation with another dog, but, but luckily he seemed to be asleep enough so that he it didn't really, didn't really 